Hello, everybody. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Hello, everybody. We'll be starting in a second. Okay, it's 3.01. Uh, hope everybody can hear me uh, nice and clear. Uh, I'll get started. Uh, so my name is uh, Santiago, uh, and I'm gonna be talking about enabling labs and simulation across virtual platforms. Uh, this was work done at Caltech by myself uh, Professor uh, George Yungowski, who's right here in the audience, here's George, hey George, uh, as well as student Anne Tran, uh, who did this work, uh, part of this work as part of the last summer uh, fellowship. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Caltech right now is in, um, in final exams, uh, so he won't be here with us today. So, what is this work all about? And I'm gonna try to make a big effort to, to synchronize the, the, the script uh, showing on the chat as with my talk. So forgive me if I run behind every now and then. Um, the goal of this whole project is to be able to create this seamless fluid spaces uh, where people can go and they can learn and they can immerse themselves in labs and study scientific phenomena that's usually intrinsically 3D, um, at the same time as being surrounded by other people, uh, being surrounded by peers, by instructors, uh, by TAs. So the main key words to take out of this is first the seamless. We try to make this as easy as possible without the technology overwhelming you. Uh, we want to be able to, to enable learning uh, and we want to be able to be, bring these this large, complex things into, in, into everybody's uh, you know, room or lab space. Um, and the social interaction is something that we are all aware of. We know that, that it's a great thing. Um, but more interestingly, when we come to Caltech, uh, we're talking usually about complex simulations, you know, complex physical phenomena. 
and usually we write codes uh, or we study the, the math to make to understand how it works. Um, and the collaborators, you know, our students and our TAs, and the, the complexity of the 3D is what we're going to try to tackle, as, as, as well as having this strong sense of presence, which we know uh, virtual worlds and virtual reality are really strong at showing. So let's kind of split it up little by little. Let's start with complex simulations. Um, so what does it mean for, for a complex simulation to be? Uh, we're usually talking about phenomena that has uh, a strong mathematical background that needs to be uh, you know, studied and broken down and able to be understood. Uh, in the context of Caltech, most of this starts as simulations done in MATLAB. Uh, so MATLAB is this uh, language slash scientific environment where you can go in, you can punch a bunch of math questions, and you can run them through matrices, and you can tell them to spit it out. You can run simulations, and it has a large set of, of working tools and APIs to help you accomplish these things. Uh, it, it, it can be difficult to learn. Uh, building user interfaces on top of MATLAB can be quite difficult, uh, but it's very powerful. And it has statistics analysis, has biological uh, work, it has um, it has uh, uh, lots of machine learning nowadays. Uh, but it is it is not the easiest thing, and it, it will uh, it will run slow. So most of the times, researchers will start their work in MATLAB, but soon they'll carry on to another language that allows them to be still flexible but can run a lot faster. Uh, nowadays, the, the the preferred language is Python. Back in the day, it was C plus plus or Fortran, even Java tried to do a little bit back in the day, but Python is the language to, that, that gets used most nowadays. Uh, there's another language called Julia, which is an up-and-comer, which is also interpreted, but it's really good at handling large data sets and manipulating large data sets with large precision. So let's jump back to the other point, which is the, the spatial understanding. Um, we're talking about things in 3D. Uh, so the way I always, uh, when I talk about 3D, uh, I always think about looking at a tree. Uh, how hard is it to understand the structure of a tree? Well, if you're looking at it in real life, you can tell the outer structure, uh, but otherwise it's, it might be a little difficult to tell what's inside the tree. A picture can, again, give you a good idea of what the tree looks on the outside, but if you really want to understand what's happening inside the tree, you kind of have to stick your head inside the tree. And even once you stick your head inside the tree, you just really see branches, and there's lots of occlusion, and it's kind of hard to see what's inside. Um, so is there tools out there to understand uh, 3D spatiality better? And there is tools out there. Uh, the more obvious one is, well, if 2D screens are not making, not, not doing the, the perfect job, can we do something that actually use the stereoscopic view that we used to? Or we have a headset that, by tracking the position, gives you kind of the, uh, the motion parallax, which is what we call, we can see the occlusion kind of moving a little left and right and gives you the whole sense of depth. There's all these cues that give you 3D depth, 3D depth. And virtual reality uses at least two of them within the, within the position of your, of your headset and the stereoscopy to actually see 3D. But again, just like I said before, even if you're in virtual reality, if you put your head inside your data set, inside your, the tree, there's not much you can tell. Now, augmented reality is just basically uh, virtual reality, but in the context of real space. But ultimately, if we want to really understand something, we have to develop tools that are highly specialized for the particular data set that we're looking at. Uh, in some cases, that means relying on 3D, but ultimately going into some kind of uh, depth uh, layering or going into 2D projections. That is always uh, the, a, a solution that needs to be explored. It's not always just on 3D. And at Caltech, we have expanded the whole range of work. Uh, we just presented this work that you're seeing right now. This is actually some uh, virtual reality uh, tool that was developed to be able to, to find potential cancerous nodules inside the bronchioles of a lung. Uh, so we had a, a, a data set where you can actually dive into the data set, eventually come down to a small subset. And once you were in that small subset, and that's what we're looking at right here, then the amount of occlusion that happens is not so terrible that it becomes understandable. It's fairly discernible, stru discernible structures. Now that in 2D would still be very difficult to see, and that's what radiologists do, right? They look at, look at slices of this data set and they try to find where these possible nodules are. In virtual reality, at the perfect size and in the right position, it was actually very easy for even lame, uh, layman people to actually go there 
and select particular nodes and be able to understand where uh, where where things are. So in this particular case, virtual reality was in fact a big help, but it's not. That's not always the case. Uh, in fact, the case that we're looking at right now, this is some work that was uh, done uh, with some uh, climate simulations that are done at Caltech as well as part of the CLIMAP project. So here they're trying to simulate the whole uh, 3D volumetric interaction of weather, of wind and temperature and humidity uh, throughout the globe. So we're looking really large scale data. So looking at the whole globe, looking at the weather, even in 3D, just it's, it's, it's ununderstandable. So you have to, again, take it down to, to a smaller region this is about, a, a, uh, I think it's one kilometer by one kilometer, a thousand meters by a thousand meters. And now we're looking at the 3D structure. We can take a layer of it and we, seeing the 3D structure in this particular layer is slightly meaningful, but there's also just a lot of information that we do not see in this one cut in this view on the left. Now the view on the right, this 2D view, that's actually what, geo, what, what uh, climatologists and what geophysicists and most of the sciences that when you start going into deep dives, that is actually what they're interested in. These cuts where they can actually measure things is, pro, is ultimately what gives them the most information. In this case, the 3D gives them a good sense of navigation. And that, for that, 3D is extremely good at for giving you a sense of position of where to look at. But ultimately, these 2D tools are much better. And that's really the case versus when we see this other work this is some work that was done also at Caltech by uh, Mitch Gutman, uh, where they actually figure out the 3D structure of the DNA as it's packed inside a cell. Uh, so they basically were able to map the positions of the chromosomes. The way they did that is they, they got cells to be at a particular state, which is when they're right about to divide. Um, and, when, and so they know that the structure should be a particular, in a particular uh, uh, position at that point. And they insert a chemical that actually makes the whole structure kind of break apart. And immediately they put another thing that makes them kind of solidify all over again. So now things that, that you would expect to be in different chromosomes are going to get glued right back next to each other. So now when you do the barcoding, you actually understand that, oh, the structure from chromosome 7, this part was actually touching this part of chromosome 6. That means in space, in 3D space, they're actually fairly close together. So now if you do that for many, for many iterations at the same time, then you can basically get a view of what the 3D structure of DNA was at that particular spot. So that is really impressive and just amazing, amazing work. But what does it mean to actually be able to understand this stuff? So obviously the position and how close things are to each other was very meaningful to biologists, uh, but ultimately it wasn't as useful as, the, as originally thought. In fact, what they had to rely, and you see, from the ball of hair that you see in the middle. To the left, you see a graph that actually shows how close overall different chromosomes were to each other. And, uh, and uh, on the, in the middle, you actually see uh, the same chromosome, the chromosome that was highlighted in red, chromosome number seven, kind of flattened with lines kind of showing how things were close to each other. And you can see that that, that gives you a much better sense of understanding of how different parts of the chromosome were communicating or have the possibility to communicate with each other because they were actually in physical proximity. And ultimately, even the matrix all the way in the full right, which is an interaction matrix, was what they actually decided, uh, what, they actually, uh, what they actually rely on. So this is how showed that you know, 3D is good context, but there's all this other work that needs to happen alongside of it. Uh, so that requires a lot of work, a lot of iteration, a lot of uh, what we call contextual inquiry, figuring out what people need to see and how they need to see it and where they need to see it. And then we need to develop tools for that. For that, for that reason. And the last part of, of, of the reason why we're doing this is kind of this whole sense of collaboration, being together in the same space and be able to relate to each other. Um, so we actually started with this work creating what we call the enhanced reality teaching space. This is actually a full virtual reality tool built in Unity uh, with uh, Vive and Oculus and, and, and Microsoft headsets. Um, and we can actually have multiple students join the same classroom. So here we're seeing a top view in the classroom. Um, you can actually log in, uh, you're giving a, a link by your teacher, and then you actually go into the classroom and you select where you wanna sit. Uh, this feels very similar to to what we see in, in in Second Life in virtual worlds, but in this case, your head actually gives you a, a sense so you can actually look around, look at different things, 
and ultimately use your, your, your navigation tool to actually be able to jump and go to the right place. Again, teleportation in virtual reality works a lot better than walking around. Uh, when you walk around and, and you move too fast, that's a, a good chance to get uh, motion sickness. Uh, and I'm a person who gets motion sickness very easily. Uh, so for me to develop work in virtual reality means that I'm always trying to do things that feel calm and feel like you could actually be in that environment for quite a bit of time. Uh, so eventually you go into this classroom and, and you find your spot where you can sit. Uh, so you see a bunch of buttons. You see the same screen that's being shared with the PowerPoint presentation by everybody, um, Google Slides actually. And on the left, you actually see this little blackboard. And this little blackboard is something you can actually write on directly. And if you can save it, you can share it, you can post it to a larger blackboard so everybody can see it. But the other cool thing that we could do is add buttons so people can say, uh, answer to question A, B, C, or D. But we also ask not only a question button, but a confusion button. Uh, so Caltech students are known for being extremely smart. Uh, but because they're kind of the smartest people from their high schools that made it to college, so now they're all together in one single space. So now they're actually extremely shy about asking questions because they don't want to look, you know, uh, uh, not smart in front of their peers. Uh, so Caltech students are actually very difficult to, to get them to open up and ask questions. So we added this confusion button. And basically that what it allows is allow anybody, anytime a student is confused, they just hit this confusion button. And then the, the instructor on the front gets a report of just how many people are currently confused and for about a 30 second span. So if all of a sudden the, the instructor in the front notice that half of the class is confused, they can just pause and say, oh, whoops, okay, let me readdress that without actually kind of uh, showing who is actually the one that's being confused. Um, so this is just one of the many things that obviously makes, uh, you know, virtual spaces, um, um, you know, make it easy to, to create this kind of tools for, for interesting education and, and teaching people. But more importantly, we created these other spaces, these alcoves, where we can actually deploy simulations. We can look at, 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 at simulations together, or we can interact or, you know, talk about things, but also in, in a small group uh, scenario and isolated from the other alcoves, similar to what breakout rooms are in Zoom. Um, so the, the main structure for, for, the, for the work that we did uh, was, was basically we had this central server, uh, which actually was uh, created using uh, the Photon Unity Network, which is part of Unity. Uh, and the clients were done with Steam VR alongside with Unity. So there was one special client, which is called the master client, the one that the teacher would actually control. And then, and then all the students would actually just join individually and they would give them given the slides and then they would have to find their own position. So this actually worked out fairly well. We run a couple of, of, of small sample classes in this space. The communication worked pretty well. Everybody running headsets uh, run, run pretty good. And we could easily handle you know, a half an hour lecture and we actually felt like we were next to each other. And there was a good sense of presence and be able to interact and, and talk to people and, and do all sorts of interesting fun things. Um, however, the whole point was to create this collaborative lab space. So we needed a way to kind of enhance this and actually bring that space into work. So we decided to create what we call the ERT concierge. Uh, so the ERT concierge is basically a relay server that lets you talk to the clients, in this case, the Unity, uh, the Unity VR clients, as well as an application running in the back, and we would just run simple socket communication from 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 the from the uh, from the um, from the concierge to the service. Uh, so, like I said before, the two more popular things at Caltech is MATLAB and Python. Uh, so that's what we did. We created a a full calculator in MATLAB that opened a socket communication, and then would be shared among everybody in the classroom. And you could interact with this 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 this, this calculator. You could punch in new equations and they would get run parameterized and sent to the front end as a mesh or a set of vectors uh, in case we're looking at the gradient or, or the, uh, the fastest uh, direction of fastest change. Um, but similar, we also created a simulation in Python uh, for, uh, for planetary system. And this is one of the classes that most uh, second year students take. So they learn how to, how, to, how, to, how, to, how to do this. And we were able to create a single simulation where everybody in the classroom was actually looking at the same simulation. And not only were they looking at the same simulation, but they could interact with it. So with, with the one, they could actually punch a planet and kind of knock it out of its axis, or they could go into the board and actually change you know, the, the, uh, the gravity constant, or they could, they could actually change the mass of a planet or the distance. And of course, the first thing that you learn is that just a small change kind of knocks the thing 
out of the place and either just collapses into the sun or just gets thrown completely out of the room. Uh, so as 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 a as a as a way to figure out how things work together, it was a really great beginning, and it was it's fun to actually see this planet spinning and 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 seeing all these things uh, move around. But now it's like okay, so that was uh, the, the the original ERT, the original VR classroom was in 2018. Uh, the extensions uh, for the MATLAB and Python were done in 2019, and then 2020 was the year we were going to clean it all up and make sure the virtual reality was running smooth from end to end, and it was really easy to deploy things uh, uh, for the front end as well as for the back end. But of course, summer 2020 is when the uh, is when we were all locked down and the pandemic had already officially started, you know, two months before. So we kind of had to rethink what we were going to do the first summer. Uh, so one of the things that we decided is as we as we looked at closer to this was the fact that there was no reason why to purely stick with virtual reality. We could actually use other platforms. In fact, it was going to be really hard for us to ship these headsets to all our students across the country, uh, and also they re require a really fast laptop that actually be able to run virtual reality or a large computer. So that's not something we're going to do. So the first thing that we said is, why do we actually do a client that works alongside the virtual reality client? But you know, it's actually a, a, a browser. We're ready to communicate doing communication versus sockets. So there's no reason why we can't do this, do this via, uh, uh, via, via web browser. So that's exactly what we did. We created a new clients. Uh, one, what, what we work on a, on, a, on a web browser using uh, Babylon, which is a 3D engine. That way we can actually have the spinning planets and the spinning MATLAB calculator uh, alongside with JavaScript. Uh, as, and we also started working on an Android uh, the version that would actually use AR core to actually visualize this thing in, uh, in, in augmented reality. But the other thing that we actually decided to do was to actually kind of really clean up this, ser this server, this, this concierge uh, that wa was working in the middle. In fact, what we decided to do was to redo the concierge and, and go from Unity, which is this just application made for building games, to actually do something that was fairly efficient at doing socket communication. And of course, we looked at Python because it's really easy to create Python, uh, Python socket applications. But in fact, there's a language that has been catching on for the last five years and it, everything from Discord uh, to Slack, and uh, I think uh, GitHub, a lot of these places actually use this language called Rust. Rust is highly specialized. Uh, if you know about computer science, uh, you know a lot of problem is how you do garbage collect when you create variables and you dispose them. You know uh, things like uh, JavaScript. You know you just end up losing memory all over the place. Uh, things like uh, like Java, uh, you know, are very tight. So just carbon collection takes quite a while, and in C++ is uh, very easy to shoot yourself on the foot. You can get pointers to everything. So if you do your own garbage collection, you can be very efficient. But if you do the wrong thing, things can just go haywire and can have crashes all over the place. So Rust was a language that I can actually do the, the the highly efficient Rust uh, a garbage collection and highly efficient communication. So it is. So we had a, a, this amazing student Antran, uh, who was able to create this uh, this server using Rust. Uh, not only that, but he created the front end clients. Um, so this is a screenshot of the same, the same uh, Python simulation that was running the planetary uh, planetary science, uh, but actually showing it on on a web browser. So using uh, Babylon, we can have an interactive three D space, and we could also add a chat server so people can talk to each other. So for people who didn't have audio and weren't on VR, could actually talk through the chat. Um, here's another example. This is actually a VR, uh, sorry, a, a Rust game. So it uses full physics with little blocks kind of blocking each other and kind of hitting each other. And anybody who comes into the server actually actually, actually runs uh, these things on the fly. And this was all using Babylon. And Babylon is just a nice wrapper around WebGL. Uh, and hopefully, again, this is one of the things, you know, WebGL is already deprecated. So now we're moving on to uh, web GPU, so hopefully you know Babylon and 3JS are starting slowly to move to uh, web GPU as well, although it's not fully uh, fully supported anywhere else. Uh, so this was the work that we actually did uh, for the ERT concierge, um, and these are the applications, and they they run beautifully and they work quite great. Um, now, how, uh, so let me uh, put if anybody wants to look at uh, at some videos of this thing running live, I'll put it on the chat. Um, and then I'll go a little more detail about how the actual the the 
this uh, this this web server actually works. Um, so obviously the things to make it as flexible as possible. So once you start your concierge, you basically both have clients and services registered to this concierge. So basically, a a, a service like the MATLAB server, once you spin it up, you just point it at the concierge, and now the concierge knows like, hey, there's actually a MATLAB service going out to them. That makes it really easy to add, you know, a MATLAB server and a chat server for the Rust game and a chat server at the same time. And on the other side, we have front clients, and the client just taps onto to the front to the, to the concierge and says, what are, what services are there allowed? What sessions are there going on? And then you can actually connect to a session. Uh, this was all done using a JSON-based API, and JSON is this natural language JavaScript-based uh, uh, based uh, uh, formatting uh, API. Uh, it just uses brackets and collections separated by colon. It's actually quite easy to read, and it's fairly standard and supported by most languages nowadays. Python, JavaScript, they all, they all support this JSON format. So our communication is done with this JSON format. You send an identification, you get a hello back, all nicely wrapped up in, in JSON. Um, so the way we actually do this originally is, is, uh, is, is, first of all, you start a client, and the client can actually request the, the, the ERT concierge even knows of services to spin up a service. Uh, so in this case, we, we could ask the client, uh, a client could log into the, to the, to the server and say, hey, you know what, go ahead and start a chat server. And after that, anybody that, that comes online can just connect to this chat server. And then if a, if a message gets sent to the IT concierge, it bounces back from the chat server, and then everybody gets a, a, an announcement that a chat message has been sent around. So that's kind of the main structure of what the ERT concierge is. Well, it is Rust, and it's nicely complicated and strong and deep. Uh, we're trying to make it so that all you have to do is figure out how to spin it up on the command line, and then it's running, you know the port, and then you'll have to always learn how to use the, the API, and with that you can start your own services, or you can use the services that we provide, and you can create the clients that we provide, or you can start creating your own clients. So in fact, that's kind of the direction we want to take it on, and that's the kind of the work that we're gonna be working on this summer. Um, so the summer is actually kind of taking it one step further and pushing pushing both the clients that we can offer in the back, as, uh, sorry, the services that we offer in the back, as well as the clients that we put, show in the front. And obviously one of the clients that, that we're really interested in, in, in expanding to is Second Life. Now, how would a Second Life client look as connected uh, to, an, to the ERT concierge? Again, it's actually gonna depend on uh, what application is. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, this is what the uh, what what the uh, the, ER, the ERT Rust game looks like, and this is what the uh, the, sa the same Rust game could look inside Second Life. Uh, so basically, if we pre-create the objects, all we have to do is open a socket communication, and then we tap onto to the sockets that are already running the Rust server uh, through the ERT concierge, and then all we have to do is update the positions for the blocks. Obviously, we need to, uh, you know, the the, HD, the the socket communication, as far as we understand, is already supported in the second life scripting language. Uh, so it becomes just an issue about object creation. Uh, in the case of the blocks, we can have a bunch of blocks pre-created and just hidden, so we don't actually have to create objects, we just manipulate the positions of the blocks. Uh, but we're also exploring more interesting things like actually uh, be able to create surfaces on the fly through the 2D projections uh, uh, and doing that both through web browser as well in Second Life. Uh, so that's actually going to prove to be much more challenging, uh, but that's some work that we're really uh, fo interested in focus on taking on this. So uh, with that, we've basically been able to create uh, our and, and kind of start tackling our original goal of creating a space where we can expose these complex simulations and we can have multiple collaborators work in the same in the same environment. And we have a strong sense of 3D speciality. We have the ability to have a virtual world or virtual reality or interesting 3D projections inside a web browser so people can actually understand what they're looking at and how they're looking at. But what I think we're, 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 we we realized quickly and we, we got really excited by it, is the fact that we could actually kind of connect all these things together. There's no reason to do these things separately. We can have the same the same sessions being shared by virtual reality, augmented reality, or a browser. In fact, we can think of this as a full ecosystem. We can think of actually being completely working 
in your browser version, which is what really what most people do, right? Most people are usually on their desktop working, looking at, at things that look at Excel files and they're using MATLAB and actually doing projections and looking at matrices and, and looking at different things. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't just manually select a subset of the data and then say, okay, this particular subset of the data, not just show it in a web browser, but show it to me in 3D and jump into AR or even in VR. And in fact, that is where technology is going. There's lots of talk about how the next set of AR glasses that will be generated will actually be lightweight enough that you can actually wear them all the time and hopefully have even the ability to completely opaque the browser, the viewer, so you can actually jump into full virtual reality. Of course, if you actually tethered to your, to your desktop, then hopefully you have the full rendering power of your desktop. But also we know with 5G communication, uh, there's also lots of people, uh, including NVIDIA and HTC, fully streaming stereographic views from serve from remote servers and from Amazon servers that can be actually uh, directly streamed into your glasses. So lots of this computation can actually be done on the cloud in parallel, and you can actually get a full stereoscopic view in your in in your browser. And that means that you can actually create a very a very cohesive space to actually do all this work. And we can actually start feeling that we can actually do this seamlessly. We can actually explore by creating this overall ecosystem that connects services and clients. And not only the services are available for you to interact and map as information back and forth, but the clients themselves, you could actually be taking over three clients at once and you just seamlessly kind of go between one client and the other. And for now, we can do this just by simply putting on our, our, our HoloLens and then taking it off uh, because otherwise it gets too heavy. <laughs> or, or we could actually do this, you know, in five, ten years when we actually have these much more lightweight systems that actually lets you uh, let you go back and forth. So overall, that is the arch of the work that we, we we've been trying to that we've been working on. And like I mentioned, most of the work was actually done by students uh, in past summers, and we're we're very uh, excited about the work that's being going to be done uh, this coming summer. Uh, what does uh, the summer, the work that's, that, that, that we're working on can include? Well, the integration of more services. Uh, I show you the example of the weather uh, simulation that's part of the CLIMA project done by Professor Tapia Schneider at Caltech. Uh, and we're collaborating with him and that's actually done in Julia. Uh, so we're hoping to actually be able to wrap around this, uh, the, the simulations being done in Julia and actually be able to connect to it through the ERT concierge. Uh, we're also really excited about about uh, about doing more clients, uh, starting with the Second Life uh, as as a possibility. It's going to be very specific to some applications as we figure out um, how we actually get to work this uh, uh, to creation for creation of meshes and introducing new elements uh, into Second Life. Um, and I think a, a direction that we that we really uh, need to focus on is if this if the concierge is easy enough to spin up and somebody provides you with applications, either MATLAB or Python or whatever simulation you have in the back end, then it really becomes up to professors uh, and instructors to be able to say, okay, let me give an interface that will let you, you know, manipulate the code or let you punch in these different variables or punch in different concepts so you can yourself do the research of what this difference means. Uh, so that means actually, um, that actually means uh, having, uh, providing the, the front end uh, users with the ability to quickly prototype web applications. Uh, and there's lots of work being in, being done for fast uh, UI prototyping uh, for web, uh, but we need to, we want to extend that and, 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 and wrap it so that we can make it easier for uh, instructors and teachers and Caltech professors to be able to deploy these solutions to their students and be able to actually kind of tap into the whole ERT ecosystem that we're creating. And the last one, uh, the last piece that we're really excited about uh, is this idea of where can we go from here, not just for sciences, but maybe for social interaction. And the pandemic really kind of kicked that, that idea off. Uh, the moment that the pandemic hit, uh, one of the things that we realized, you know, uh, George uh, was, is very big in the Second Life community, was like, okay, you know what? Maybe this is a really good time for, for Caltech to have a Second Life presence and bring all these uh, all these first year students into space where they can actually talk to each other and they can meet and they can collaborate and they can find peers um, and, and, and they can be in this stress-free environment and kind of semi-safe environment uh, where they can actually talk to each other and, and, and start meeting each other. Um, 
Um, so uh, the way we, we break it down is, is we understand that students right now, basically the only way they're meeting each other is via Zoom. Uh, and again, this could be expanded to virtual reality or virtual worlds. Um, we're already working on, on our second live version, which is called Vertec. Uh, but then uh, within the context of a classroom, the way you actually start talking directly to other students is when they break you up into group projects. Um, and that usually, again, happens usually to Zoom breakout rooms, and then people create Slack, Slack channels, and they start talking to each other. Um, and now they can start kind of meeting each other. And then usually really close friendships get built one and one when people start talking to each other. In the case of, 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 of Caltech, when we did our user studies, uh, it turned out that for most of people, uh, most students at Caltech, that end up being uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, of course, there's other tools like uh, Gather Town or uh, Discord, which is purely audio, uh, that actually try to make uh, sense of spaces. And the truth is that each of them does have a reason for existing, and they do have some positives. But with all the positives they have, they also have plenty of negatives. So it brings us down again to why are we bothering to think of a single solution to accomplish all of this? Um, that's a little short-sighted. What we really need to think is how do we create an ecosystem where you can have students bounce between these applications and actually be able to talk to each other? How do you have a student look at, at Reddit on one side and being immersed in Second Life in somewhere else and having Zoom windows on the other side? and being able to switch back and forth as needed. And eventually, even yes, eventually if they're doing a lab, even be able to pull up something in VR or AR that's actually spinning in front of them. Um, so we've been researching these spaces and we're really excited that we think that ERT and the ERT concierge, especially is kind of the place where we can start playing with these things, where we can try to connect different services together. We can try to make things that when you are in experience, it can, the same experience can be copied across different platforms. Uh, we're we're kind of uh, uh, brainstorming how different ways we can connect each other, how how different ways we can uh, present these different tools, and we're really excited to actually move forward with that direction as well. So that's just kind of a little bit of tangent uh, on where we hope this ERT concierge work will go to. Um, so of course, I want to acknowledge all, all the people that worked on this project. Uh, uh, most of it was done by by students. Uh, Lucy Chen and Neto Ravi Shankar worked on in the for original ERT version 2018. Uh, Sasha and Allison worked on the ERT version of 2019. We actually included the Python and uh, and the MATLAB extensions. And then Anne pretty much did the whole uh, Rust concierge and front end uh, Babylon WebGL versions that I showed you. And I hope you get a chance to see the videos uh, while I was boring you with the slides of how. Uh, ERT communication actually works. And we had Sabrina who's actually been working on, on the Vertic version as well. Um, we want to uh, we want to thank uh, obviously and acknowledge all the work from all the people, but also the people who, who gave us funds, including the Summer Undergrad Research Fellowship Program, which helped us fund for some more students, uh, Caltech Student Services and Caltech Pro Provost Innovation Education, uh, which gave us some funds, and HTC, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Logitech, all which have given us donations of hardware for us to test things and try things and some pretty amazing graphics cards, with which some of the virtual reality could not have been done. Um, I want to encourage everybody, if, if uh, especially the uh, the virtual spaces seems uh, virtual spaces for for campuses seem kind of interesting. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Jenny Roddenhouse from Art Center College of Design, uh, of which I'm also faculty of, uh, and I will be presenting this work on designing multiplayer publics. Uh, basically, we created this uh, virtual campus class at Art Center, uh, in which we ask students to kind of think out of the box and start really exploring what it means to connect all these uh, virtual spaces for the for the use of a campus and what does it mean. And uh, the overlap between Caltech and Art Center just came up with this awesome solutions that we're going to be showing off uh, tomorrow. Uh, so with that and uh, and me going at 100 miles per hour. Uh, hopefully, uh, you got something out of the talk. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And now I'll go back into the chat and see if I can read any questions. But feel free to speak up and ask questions for me as well. Thank you.
yes so so somebody mentioned that yes even with circoscopic view and in real life the same thing either way you can only see the leaves from a tree uh but in a structure even stick your head inside there's not much you can do um uh so so virtual reality really only helps when we have a small subset of space that that is intrinsically 3d but the, the occlusion is just the right level that you can tell things from ahead and behind each other so it's all kinds of interactive cuts and and, and things work um uh, uh, are we using GIS? Uh, so, uh, so if I'm thinking of the correct GIS, uh, uh, the Caltech and the geophysics group is very close linked with the GIS project. So uh, for all the climate weather things, they are very much part of the GIS project. Uh, so yes, that is work that we're working on. And like I said, we're gonna be working on trying to connect uh, the Julia work that has been done in, uh, in climate weather. It's called the CLIMA project, if anyone wants to look it up. CLIMA, uh, the Caltech, and they do some really amazing work. Um, does the first person work, uh, does the first person control in Unity work just like the arrow keys in Second Life? Um, I, I want to say that there's different studies on, on what is, uh, what is, what actually works in, in, virtu in, 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 in actually virtual, in virtual reality. Um, you know, because moving your head naturally feels feels uh, feels like the right thing. If the controller is forcing you to turn or forcing you to move, that actually feels very unnatural. Uh, right now, we have a dispen because we're looking at a uh, like in Second Life, we're looking at a 3D browser next to the screen. We have a layer of disconnection between the 3D and us. So when the when the when the avatar moves in Second Life with the cursor, we're controlling it, but we we we, we have a little bit of understanding. Uh, of what the difference is. When you're in full virtual reality, that conflicts with your natural head movement. So that's why teleporting works a little better, or also uh, lily, what we call lily pad jumping. So basically jumping discrete steps forward or even rotating at every 15 degrees. So rather than rotating smoothly, if you do 15 degree move, uh, 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 rotation with a, with a controller, that actually works extremely well. And there's some really good examples of doing that. Uh, so, I mean, virtual reality has like, in, so the keynote has been around for a long while, but the ways we actually interact in, in, in virtual reality, uh, they, those things need, still need to be tweaked and standardized. And that's still quite a, quite a couple of years away from somebody actually coming up with a good, strong, uh, virtual VR operating system. Uh, have we considered uh, the Unity asset extremality? Uh, we have uh, not considered it, but actually sounds uh, really exciting. We're uh, we're actually kind of making sure that we start this summer. Uh, Unity also has a, a a way to connect the whole AR system. Uh, um, I forgot what it's called. Unity AR Universe, Unity AR Core. It has a special name because you know Euphoria doesn't exist anymore. So now they're they're basically competing between AR Kit and AR Core. You know, uh, uh, basically the and I guess mixed reality is also in the game. Uh, can, can I get in? Because I asked the, I put the comment in about extremality. Uh, extremality is a full virtual world. You get chat, you get um, avatars, which you can customize. You can create your own worlds and simulations. It's fully Unity based, fully based on PUN, so you're not going to have any problem there. Um, and um, I know the developer, uh, Kevin Tweedy. He's upgrading it to version, tw he's got it to 2019 now, he's going to 2020. So I would strongly recommend. It sounds like that would be a natural fix for you guys. You that want to get into awesome. a virtual world. This is good, and I, I think more than a fix is an extension. It's just another yes. client that we can put under our belt. That sounds really good, and maybe we can just throw a student and say, "Do this in the first two weeks, and you're done." <laughs> that sounds awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, uh, desktop reality, yes. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, calling down. I built a Oh yes, uh, yes. So uh, anybody can, uh, if you want to contact me uh, about any questions, you know, I'm Santiago at Caltech.edu, uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll put the link for our project page as well, um, and uh, I'll put the link for the for the slides if anybody cares to look at them, but not copy them. <laughs> So uh, and uh, uh, just for fun, I'll put the links to the videos again. Uh, 
you can see in the, the little uh, ERT uh, planetary simulation on ERT game, are really fun to see in actually running. Um, awesome. Any other questions in the last couple of minutes? There's another question in chat. To, I'll just vocalize it. This is Sidearm. What does the technology of the Second Life engine slash viewer add to your pre-existing set of technologies for your combined vision? Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, the, the reason why why we decided to do Vertec, our, our, our virtual Caltech environment in Second Life, uh, was because of all the tools to actually allow multiple people to come in. The, the size of the servers works very easy. Uh, be able to handle this number of students. It also, uh, there's lots of, of, of other places that people can go travel and then come back to our safe space. Also, the, the restriction by material levels. Uh, we need to be very FERPA compliant. Uh, so whenever we ask students to sign up, we need to make sure that we can protect them. So uh, the fact that we can say, okay, you, you all rated at a G level, uh, if they change themselves afterwards, that's their business. Uh, but we can make sure that works. So um, as, far as, as, as far as the technology itself, uh, that second life for for scripting language, uh, you know the the fact that uh, that we can do socket communication uh, gets us excited. The fact that we can open that we can create a a, a sample template on how to connect to the ERT Concy Verge from a second life client, and then kind of start creating templates. Okay, now that you've connected the second life client, this is how you populate, uh, you know, text windows. This is how you control objects. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of things that we can control between the connection of the second life scripting, the socket communication, and the objects in the vicinity that we find pretty exciting and, and, and we hope to work. Now, as far as the combined vision, um, we think the sense of presence and location, especially, that second life brings uh, is, is really strong. And that without the zoom window, without your camera on. So basically the ability to, to be able to walk to a different group of people, peek into their conversation, hear what they're saying and then walk away uh, or be able to go in and then jump in the conversation and then if if at some point people are saying you know what let's i want to see each other then there has to be a way to transition into a different space where you can see each other see each other's faces uh and also be able to or, or a lot of things people people play minecraft and terra that's kind of a big thing uh how do you how do you find other people that like the same thing connect in second life and then transition into Minecraft and into Terra, and then somehow minimize your second life viewer so that it's running in the corner. It's not complaint. It's not overtaking too many graphics. Uh, so those are the challenges that we're still working on, uh, and I think we're it's an exciting venue for research. How do how do we create it so that second life can be part of the solution, but you're not in second life a hundred percent of the time, but you're really organically allowing the their relationships and the task to control what, what the attention goes for the user. And yes, Dave, it'd be great if you can connect me to Kevin. You're welcome. Cool, right on time. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'll be here for the next uh, five minutes. I'll be taking my screen with me. And um, if anybody has any questions, just you know, come up and chat it up. Thank you, everybody.